Good evening. Welcome to the 2013 Mary Stevens Breckford Memorial Lecture in European Studies. My name is John McGowan. I'm the director of the Institute for the Arts and Humanities. And this is a great evening every year for the Institute when we honor the memory of Mary Stevens Reckford and bring a distinguished scholar in European studies to, have a, to present his or her work and have a conversation with us here in Chapel Hill. The Reckford Lecture was created by classics professor Kenneth Reckford in memory of his wife Mary and has now for over 20 years brought us distinguished scholars in European studies. And if you look at the back of your program, you will see the astounding list of people who have given the Reckford Lecture since its first instantiation in 1990. This yearly event epitomizes what the Institute for the Arts and Humanities stands for, a lively communal engagement with cultural traditions and values in the inquisitive spirit of the liberal arts. I am grateful to Ken Reckford and the Reckford family for their support of the lecture and of the Institute over all these years. I am pleased to see that Joseph Reckford is here tonight in the audience. And I'd love for us to give a round of applause for the Breckford family. Thank you, Joseph. Great. Evenings like this one do not happen by themselves. I have the great pleasure of having a remarkably efficient staff that makes my life easier every day over at the Institute for the Arts and Humanities. Tonight I want to have a special shout out to Allison Barnes and Elaine Erdeshek who did most of the heavy lifting for tonight's event. So please do join me in thanking Allison and Elaine. I also want to thank Emil Kang and Reed Culver, Emil is not here but Reed is, of Carolina Performing Arts, with whom the IAH has been working this academic year as part of the ongoing celebration of the 100th anniversary of the Rite of Spring. Tonight's lecture is a contribution to that year-long celebration. Our format this evening will be a 50-minute formal lecture by Professor Puchner, and after that, he will take questions for as long as you have them, he tells me. So uh, we, will, we will go to midnight if, uh, if it's warranted. Um, there is also, a, there will be a reception following the Q&A. So please stay around and eat some of the goodies. And we also have copies of Professor Putner's books over here. So if anyone would like to purchase copies of the books, they're available. And I think you could probably prevail upon Martin to sign a copy if you if you buy a book. Martin Puchner is the Byron and Anita Wien Professor of Drama at Harvard University. His many books are listed in your program, so I'm not going to repeat all that information. I can tell you that I wanted to bring Martin to campus because of his book, Poetry of the Revolution, which won the MLA's prize for the best book in 2006. Poetry of the Revolution is a study of the modernist avant-garde movements through an examination of their, one of their most characteristic forms, the manifesto. This focus allows Puchner to address the political aspirations of the various avant-gardes, while also attending to the formal and aesthetic properties of their art. He thus avoids collapsing politics into art, or vice versa. His more recent book, The Drama of Ideas, walks a similar tightrope in considering the relationship between ideas and modern drama. We all know that works of art are plainly and directly motivated by the desire to express some idea or to advance some political agenda, but that when they do that too directly, they usually fail as works of art. What Puchner, as a critic, does so well is to explore that tension between ideas and art or politics and art by recognizing that there is a relation, but a difficult and fraught relation. I also have to express my admiration for the crystalline clarity of Puchner's prose. He is an all too rare example of a literary critic who is doing work that excites the experts in his field in articles and books that also are completely accessible to undergraduates and the general public. His commitment to non-academic audiences 
is evidenced by his work for such journals as the London Review of Books, Book Forum, and N Plus One. Professor Puchner's lecture this evening is entitled Theater and Philosophy, Socrates and the Modern Stage. Please join me in welcoming him to Chapel Hill. Thank you so much. Thank you for this lovely invitation. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. And it's a pleasure to be here as part of the uh, uh, celebration of the Rite of Spring. Now, as you by now know better than anyone, probably, the Rite of Spring is really a kind of quintessential modernist artwork. And it really now embodies what we, in retrospect, primarily associate with modernism. Why? Because first, it is a work of ritualism and primitivism. And there's a story of, uh, of modernism that goes like this, that sometime in the end of the 19th century, Western art uh, had reached a dead end and was looking for rejuvenation and turned to exotic locales or folk arts uh, and other forms of ritual art uh, to return to its origin and somehow be re-inspired by, uh, by those origins. Rite of Spring is part of that movement an interest in primitivism and exoticism. It's also a quintessential modernist art work because of its shock value. Uh, as you may know, there were riots at the opening of the Rite of Spring. Uh, audiences were shocked by, in, in part by its uh, ritualistic properties. And that too became a kind of typical feature. The history, especially of theater, of modern theater, could be told as a history of theater riots to the point where it be, almost became a requirement for a modernist to cause a theater riot uh, in order to be recognized as a modernist. And it is a form of uh, quintessential art, uh, the Rite of Spring, because it emphasizes the body. The dancer Nijinsky, the Bali Rus, uh, it was all seen as a return from a too intellectual form of modern art back a return to the body, uh, to the body in motion, uh, to a kind of celebration of corporeality. So for these reasons, we, we can now really play something like the Rite of Spring at the center of modernism, and I'm thrilled to be part of this celebration, uh, the celebration of the Rite of Spring. Part of the idea behind this ritualization of art was that art would become more communal, would somehow be returned to, to the communal aspect of, uh, of, of art. So I'm very happy to join this community of celebrants of the Rite of Spring. At the same time, there's this little demon. And this demon whispers in my ear that the, right of, the kind of modernism that is in, embodied by the Rite of Spring is not all of modernism that there is a different kind of modernism, a different kind of art that doesn't emphasize the ritual, that doesn't emphasize the body and corporeality, that is not out to create shock values, but that instead is interested in philosophy and ideas. And today I want to describe a, the second trajectory that, that leads to a different kind of modernism, not the modernism of ritual and primitivism and corporeality, but a modernism uh, fueled by, among other things, an engagement with philosophy. Now, in order to tell the story, I want to return you to a moment, an originary scene, uh, a scene that takes place in fifth century Athens, in which the protagonist is already an established man of the theater. He's become the choreographer, the, the leader of the chorus, which is an important uh, role in the Athenian theater world. But he's ambitious, and there's one further aspiration for him, and that is to win first prize at the annual festival, uh, theater festival, uh, as playwright. And so this young, ambitious man of the theater has written a tragedy, and he's on his way to submit this tragedy for the festival. And on his way, he encounters a group of people who are engaged in a heated discussion. Um, he stops and listens to their arguments and recognizes that they're talking to the notorious public speaker, Socrates. And he finds himself strangely compelled by the way 
in which Socrates questions the assumption of, of, of his opponents. And he's so compelled by this that he decides to become a student of this man. And then, in order to confirm this decision, he takes his tragedy and burns it. Now, this student, uh, as you may have guessed, is Plato. And the scene is transmitted to us. I have admittedly embellished it to some extent. But the central components, including the burning of the tragedy, is transmitted to us by Plato's first biographer, Diogenes Laertius, who even has Plato exclaim, come hither, fire god. Plato has need of you uh, as the tragedy goes up in flames. Now, the question I want to ask is why? Why did Plato burn his tragedy in order to become a student of Socrates? We could say in order to become a philosopher. Why is it necessary to burn your tragedy in order to become a philosopher? There's a standard answer to this question that goes like this, that in fact here we have a moment, an originary moment of philosophy defining itself against the theater that would continue to uh, uh, be part of the history of Western philosophy for centuries to come. And there are mostly three objections that philosophers have voiced against the theater. The first is a moral objection, that there's something morally suspicious about the art of acting, about pretending to be another person, pretending to be someone who you are not. And so they developed a kind of ethical prejudice against the theater and especially against the art of acting. This tradition often goes, is seen as going back to Plato, but its most famous exponent perhaps is someone like Jean-Jacques Rousseau who launches part of a strong ethical critique of the theater. There's another objection uh, coming from the side of aesthetics and art. And that argument goes like this. Theater is a mixed art form that brings together visual elements in music and, and, and acting and literature, and that it creates a kind of muddle and confusion among these different art forms, and that therefore the theater is bad for art because it mixes what shouldn't be mixed, because it mixes these art forms. The prime uh, exponent of this kind of aesthetic critique of, of art is Friedrich Nietzsche, but this argument too, to some extent, can be traced back to Plato. And then there's a third, probably the most important argument, philosophical argument against art, and that has to do with truth. Namely that theater, by occupying a space of representation, um, is occupying a space of untruth. And that philosophy, if it wants to reach truth, must overcome or criticize, or in any case, distance itself from the theater. And Plato is again seen as the primary exponent of art. Now, theater people have not taken kindly to these kinds of arguments. They have invented a name for that, uh, and that name is the anti-theatrical prejudice. So that built into the history of philosophy is a, is a prejudice against the theater that takes, among others, these three forms. But they also have responded in kind. I would say that there is almost an equally strong anti-philosophical prejudice in the theater that, for example, when you go to theater school, one of the first things you learn is the word drama comes from drawn, which means action, and not, as is often added, not ideas. If you try to present ideas in the theater, all hell breaks loose, it becomes a bad play. Theater is about bodies in motion, Theater is about action, theater is about drawn, it's not about ideas. Don't try to represent ideas in the theater, it will ruin the theater. So there's a kind of double prejudice, an anti-theatrical prejudice in philosophy and an anti-philosophical prejudice in the theater. And both of these stories, uh, this is a history of, in a sense, the antagonism between theater and philosophy would explain, of course, Plato had to burn his tragedy in order to become a philosopher. You cannot be both. You cannot be a, a dramatist and a philosopher at the same time. But I'm going to try to convince you today that both of these stories are in fact wrong. Um, 
that there is a tradition both within philosophy and within drama that is interested in a kind of convergence of the two leading to a tradition of the philosophical drama. And it is this tradition that I wanna take up to modernism to arrive as an alternative modernism to that represented by the rite of spring. Now, what's interesting about this is that one can actually locate the origin of this kind of philosophical drama precisely in the figure of Plato. The way to do that is to think not so much about the unkind things that Plato has on occasion said about the theater, but to look at the form of his own writing, which, as I'm sure you know, was in the form of the dialogue. So we have a dialogue, means that Plato writes philosophy by means of inventing characters, engaging these characters in conversation. All right, I wanna take this observation further and think about what, what happens once we regard these platonic dialogues as a form, an unusual form of drama. First thing to note is that these dialogues aren't just two talking heads that talk to each other. Plato takes a lot of effort to describe the scene, to set the scene uh, of his dialogues, and the setting or scene of these dialogues is actually quite crucial to the philosophical argument that, that ensues. So we have a scene, an important dramatic component. We also have action. Now it is true that many of Plato's dialogues primarily proceed through a series of arguments, and that these arguments, in a sense, form the primary action of these dialogues. But there's more than that. There's often corporeal interaction. People blush or touch each, touch each other, or have other forms of interaction that are part of the plot of these dramas uh, or philosophical dialogues. And once one pays attention to the plot of these dialogues, an interesting thing happens. They're very different from the kind of plots that we associate with uh, Greek theater, uh, with the kind of Aristotelian, tightly structured Greek drama. They often start in the middle. They go off in all different, in all different kinds of directions. They often reach a dead end and then loop back to the beginning and meander their way through various kinds of iterations. And sometimes they uh, end very abruptly without a neat conclusion. So all of this makes these uh, philosophical dialogues very, look very different from what Greek audiences would have associated with drama. But from our perspective, they look much more familiar from our perspective of modern drama. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, it's in, when thinking about these dialogues as drama, one has to think about whether and to what extent they were actually performed. Now it is undoubtedly clear that these dialogues were not written to be represented in the great outdoor theater of Athens, the Dionysus Theater that numbered 15 or 17,000 audience members. And that's why uh, Plato himself did not consider them drama in that sense, drama in the sense of being written for that particular kind of stage. However, they were performed what we probably would now call performed, that is they were read aloud by one or sometimes perhaps even several actors in front of intimate small coterie audiences in the academy. So they were in some sense performed what we would now call staged readings or, uh, or staged uh, or reading performances. And so this is what I wanna propose, that even though the con most contemporaries would not have considered these dialogues as drama, that from the vantage point of modern drama, where we are very, where small coterie audiences, unusual and meandering plots uh, uh, are very familiar ph phenomena, that we can look backwards and, and read these kinds of dialogues as a strange form of drama, that Plato, in fact, invented a strange form of drama that retrospectively we now can identify as such, that is uh, a form composed of, of setting, uh, actors, uh, uh, characters engaged in, in action, and even in this reduced and restrained way performed in front of small audiences. Now the reason why I emphasize this dramatic reading of Plato's dialogues or the argument that we can read these dialogues as drama uh, 
It's because actually there were some contemporaries who were very comfortable to associate Plato with the theatrical world. Aristotle, the greatest authority on, on classical drama, mentions the Socratic uh, dialogues, albeit in passing in his work on tragedy. I've already mentioned Diogenes Laertius and the scene in which he describes Plato as a playwright, although a playwright who then burns his tragedy. And there's also the anecdote that has Socrates stand up in the theater during a performance of The Clouds, the, uh, the Aristophanes play that is about Socrates. So we have evidence, although the source is perhaps unreliable, that Socrates indeed would go to the theater. And in fact, Diogenes Laertius in his biographies of both Plato and Socrates talks quite a lot about how the two associated with theater people and, and even claims that, that they co-wrote a play with uh, Euripides. That, uh, uh, so some, there are some classical sources that even though they don't call Plato's dialogues drama, they very much discuss them in the context of a larger theatrical uh, uh, project. Now, one of the things that happens when we look at Plato as a dramatist, as a dramatist who invented a philosophical form of drama, is that it opens up a view on an interesting tradition, a minor tradition of playwrights beginning in the 16th and 17th century who also recognized Plato as a dramatist, as a dramatist who invented the character Socrates uh, and who built his philosophy around a kind of dramatic imagination and who followed suit and who started to write what I call Socrates plays. That is plays built around the philosopher Socrates and who in a sense translated these strange quasi dramas that Plato had written into various uh, dramatic, more familiar dramatic genres. There are all kinds of Socrates plays. They're somewhat hard to find because most of the uh, playwrights writing them were rather unknown. It's, I almost hesitate to call these playwrights of the, writing these Socrates plays a tradition because many of them, in fact, didn't know about each other. That's how obscure many of them were. It's not unusual for these writers to say, to write in their prefaces, to complain that no one except for themselves had recognized Plato as an inspired dramatist and wondered why no one had proceeded to write in his tradition. And so they would say, here is my dramatization of Socrates, is the first dramatization of Socrates, and I hope many others will ensue, not knowing that in fact many others had done precisely the same thing. So it's a kind of odd tradition with, with stops and gaps that starts over and over again, uh, as I said, beginning in the 17th century and all the way to, to the 20th century. Now, most of these authors are obscure, but once in a while, uh, quite famous writers tried their hands at the Socrates play, uh, including Voltaire and Diderot, and even some famous modern dramatists such as Strindberg and Georg Kaiser. So once in a while, the Socrates play kind of surface, surfaces in the official history of drama and art. One of my favorites is a Socrates opera by Paisiello that has Socrates enter the stage with the aria, Io so che nulla so, I know that I know nothing, <laughs> Socrates' most famous line. And, and I, at least at that point when I encountered this aria, I knew that Socrates was really born on the stage, it was really a theatrical figure. Even in the 20th century, there have been some notable Socrates plays. Maxwell Anderson's play, Barefoot in Athens, ran on Broadway for several weeks. And the role of Xantippe, you might be interested to learn, was played by none other than La Delenia uh, uh, for a pretty successful run on Broadway. So the Socrates play, in many ways, is still with us. And as I mentioned, there are some uh, notable modern dramatists who tried their hands at it. Now, one thing is interesting if one cont contemplates that, that history of the Socrates play, that they fall sort of into two camps. One camp, uh, the dominant one, 
reads Plato uh, and therefore proceeds to write the Socrates play in the mode of tragedy. Many of them are called the death of Socrates. And they often, they, they often use material uh, uh, from various dialogues. Um, the middle is often occupied by uh, scenes taken from the symposium, but they invariably end with the Phaedo, the dialogue in which uh, Plato describes in excruciating detail the death of Socrates in his prison cell as he refuses to leave. Uh, his friends convince him to, to flee, but he, he refuses. He takes the hemlock and drinks it and describes even blow by blow how the poison immobilizes first his, his, his legs and then his torso and then his hands and he's literally immobilized and then he stops to speak and everyone knows that Socrates is death, dead. So the, the death of, uh, of Socrates, Socrates' tragedy. And these playwrights had a point that there were many ways, for example, in, this, uh, 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 in the Phaedo, that, Socrates, that Plato clearly uses elements of, of tragedy in the construction of his dialogues. The Phaedo is, is an excruciating reading experience. However, there is a second group, slightly less numerous, who came to a very different conclusion, namely that Plato, as a dramatist, was not a dramatist who was veering to the side of tragedy, but rather to the side of comedy, which seems on the face of it strange because Socrates' death certainly hovers uh, over all of Plato's dialogues. But they nevertheless had a point because it is clear that for within the system of Greek theater that uh, uh, Plato's dialogues are much closer to comedy than they are of tragedy. Greek tragedy was reserved for, with one exception, for mythological figures. And Socrates, as the son of a midwife and a sculptor, had a much too low a social status in order to be allowed entry into a, a tragedy. Also, Plato is, used, is very interested in, Plato, in, in, in Socrates' everyday life, in the way he appears, whether he washes, and, uh, and, and, uh, and other elements of everyday life that we associate much more closely with comedy. So there's a second uh, 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 tradition then that, that interprets Plato as, a, as an inventor of a kind of philosophical comedy. Both of these traditions, I think, allow us to look back at Plato as a dramatist and recognize in his strange plays features of both tragedy and comedy at the same time and recognize that one of the things that Plato did as a dramatist, a quasi-dramatist, was to combine these two dominant genres of Greek theater. Now this tradition of the Socrates play, and I'm not gonna try to convince you that most of these plays are works of great genius, although I've become quite fond of several of them, um, that these are works of great genius. But what's interesting to me about them is that they constitute a kind of archive or track record of dramatists looking back at, at, at Plato and, and recognizing him as indeed a dramatist. And this becomes particularly pronounced with modern drama. So I've already mentioned that one of the writers of Socrates' plays was uh, uh, Strindberg, one of the founders of modern drama who towards the end of his life wrote a play called Hellas, uh, sometimes called Socrates, in which he describes the uh, several scenes from Plato and write, tries his own hand at this now uh, more or less recognizable tradition of the Socrates play. Even more interesting and programmatic to my mind is another modernist, a German expressionist by the name of Georg Kaiser. He writes a play called Alcibiades, uh, which is built around a scene in which Socrates sa saves Alcibiades in battle. Um, but the reason why he writes this play is because he became in fact convinced that Plato was not just a dramatist, but the greatest dramatist who ever wrote a play. And he was convinced that modern drama needed to be rejuvenated 
by returning to Plato. So he wrote an essay called Plato as Dramatist in which he elaborated on this view why uh, Plato was, a, why we should see Plato as a great dramatist and why his, uh, and why his own play, Alcibiades, was, uh, was supposed to be seen as a great paradigm or example of what this new platonic theater of ideas or philosophical drama should look like. So this return to Plato, this recognition of Plato as a dramatist acquires pro programmatic uh, and almost manifesto-like qualities. Modern drama has to be a drama that returns to Plato. Now I want to take these, uh, this odd collection of characters, these uh, strange and often unsuccessful writers of Socrates' plays from the, from the 17th to the 20th century, and these two great modernists, Strindberg and, and Kaiser, and take them as an inspiration to look at modern drama through this lens, through the lens of kind of platonic tradition of a philosophical drama. Now I want to put, dwell a little bit on primarily two playwrights, two important playwrights in, in British drama, namely uh, Oscar Wilde and George Bernard Shaw. Where is my water? Ah, it's here. Now, Oscar Wilde is, is a writer that uh, absorbed Plato, read a lot of Plato while at Oxford. And Plato is all over his writings. It was at Oxford that he wrote, that Oscar Wilde noted down in his notebook, in drama, I'm a Platonist, not an Aristotelian. And this becomes my lens through which to look at Oscar Wilde. It's important also to note this opposition between Plato and Aristotle because that was one of the, uh, this was part of the impetus for several of these modern dramatists to turn to Plato because they saw in Plato a powerful alternative to what they perceived as the dominant tradition of drama, namely Aristotle's drama. So not a drama interested in tight constructions, not a drama uh, interested in the unities of time, place, and action, not a drama bound to these various orthodoxies of Aristotelian drama. Uh, and so in order to get out from under these uh, Aristotelian orthodoxies, they turn to Plato as an alternative in order to create a new drama of ideas. Now, the way uh, Oscar Wilde did this was slightly unusual because his engagement with Plato was primarily through the category of the aesthetic. That's why, we, uh, that's why he coined the term aestheticism, as we know. So he somehow translated Plato, who, as we said earlier, uh, had pretty nasty things to say about both the theater and art in general. He translated Plato into art. So this, in some sense, goes against what Plato probably would have approved but Oscar Wilde didn't very much care about that. And he was very invested in this kind of, uh, in, in Plato's theory of forms and, and translated that into a theory of art uh, that put art close to platonic forms and considered everything else sort of shallow copies. Hence the strange inversion that we often associate with aestheticism, namely that, that, that nature follows art. That was one of uh, Oscar Wilde's provocative inversions. Um, it's derived from an, uh, a translation of Plato's, Plato's philosophy into the aesthetic realm. But more important than this translation and the content, if you will, of this platonic aesthetics is the form in which he proceeded to do that, which is no, none other than the philosophical dialogue. Oscar Wilde presented most of his criticism and many of his theories in the form of the dialogue. And it is in these dialogues that he elaborated on his relationship to Plato and where he undertook that translation, the translation of Plato's theory of forms, Plato's theory of ideas into the aesthetic realm. Now, Oscar Wilde's critical 
critical dialogues are the best place to start uh, to, to, to describe why in drama he was a Platonist rather than an Aristotelian, but one can take this perspective into his other plays as well, especially in his, into his great symbolist play, Salome, that is a, is a huge and kind of fascinating celebration of beauty and art that resonates very much with these aesthetic theories called from Plato or translated from Plato into art. And one can even see it in some of his uh, comedies of manners, although there they're a little bit more hidden and harder to see. So we have so one of the big figures in British modern drama, Oscar Wilde, someone who in many ways placed Plato over Aristotle, recognized Plato as a dramatic model and proceeded to translate Plato both into aesthetic theories but also into his own dramatic practice. Wilde's contemporary, George Bernard Shaw, seems to occupy a very different mental universe. What do we associate with George Bernard Shaw? We know that he was a socialist, although a kind of strange kind of socialist, a Fabian. So, but he certainly had, had read Marx and other socialist writers and was very committed to this kind of political project, a kind of project we would now call materialism. However, the strange thing about Shaw is that even though he was a very committed socialist, his socialism was what I would describe as an idealist socialism. It was a socialism propelled forward and driven by ideas. This was partially taken from Darwin and Darwin's evolutionary theory, but translated into the realm of ideas. So Shaw believed in the shaping power of ideas. And this is nowhere as clear as in his, again, not very successful or well-known, but programmatic cycle of five plays called Back to Methuselah, which starts with Adam and Eve and ends the cycle of five plays in the year 32,363, um, in which we occupy a world where the center of the British Empire has moved to Baghdad. And England uh, is occupied by long-living sages. Shaw not only lived a very long time, he was obsessed with longevity. Long-living sages who spent their entire life contemplating mathematics and ideas. And to make that connection to Plato clear, uh, Shaw had them dress in the togas of his imaginary uh, Athens of antiquity. This last stage of history for Shaw shows a triumph of cogitation and ideas over any form of materiality. Now this is uh, sort of the shape of, of Shaw's strange theory of history, a history that's both socialist and evolutionary, but at the same time driven by ideas. It's his own strange concoction of Marx, uh, uh, Darwin, and Plato. What's interesting to me about this is that Shaw too translated that kind of uh, 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 sort of theoretical frame into a form of drama. Shaw in some sense invented or reinvented the drama of ideas or the play of ideas for the British tradition. Most programmatic in this respect is a play, one of my favorites of Shaw's, uh, uh, man and Superman, which is subtitled A Comedy and a Philosophy. And indeed, I think one could describe almost all of Shaw's plays in that way, that they are comedies, but also philosophies, that he was rigorously committed to using drama as a vehicle for uh, communicating his often very strange uh, philosophical ideas. Shaw was very fond of the term propaganda and openly described his plays as propaganda. The one should add that the word propaganda before the 30s had, was a much less pejorative term. So for, 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 for Shaw the, uh, to speak of his plays as propagandistic plays, 
probably just meant that he felt he had something to say and he wanted to use a form of drama to do that. At the same time, and that what, that's what makes them interesting combinations of theater and philosophy, he used the form of drama, and that is the whole repertory of what drama can do to invent, to invent characters, that are embodied by actors, that are situated in scenes, their stage props and actions and theatricality, and to confront that whole apparatus of the theater with ideas. This is what produces his comedies, and this is why his play, he would himself describe his plays as comedies and philosophies at the same time. Um, now Shaw too, interestingly, in one of the prefaces to his plays, I think it was Man and Superman, said something that sounds very similar to Oscar Wilde. Namely, that among the playwrights, he particularly admires Plato as the inventor of Socrates as a philosophical character. So we have here an inheritor, I would say, in, in George Bernard Shaw, of the comic tradition of the Socrates play. Of, of, a, of, a, of a kind of tradition of drama that recognized in play to a, a writer who invented a comedy of ideas. Now that tradition had one problem to contend with, and that problem was called uh, Aristophanes. In the Apology, uh, Socrates accuses Aristophanes for having contributed to the to the, uh, uh, the feeling in Athens against him for having contributed to turning Athens against him, Socrates, and therefore to having contributed to his own death, ultimate death uh, uh, of, by, by Hemlock. So many of these drama, dramatists of ideas, many of these comedians um, were worried about that because they admired Plato as a, as a playwright. They were fascinated by Socrates as a character, and yet they wanted to write comedies in the tradition of the greatest comic writers, Aristophanes. So they had a problem, how to contend with, how to write a play in the tradition of Aristophanes, namely comedy, without somehow contributing or being on the side of this great enemy of Socrates, and they grappled with this often in the prefaces to their plays, uh, where they discussed uh, Aristophanes' guilt and often tried to downplay this guilt with respect to uh, having whipped up these sentiments uh, uh, against, uh, um, uh, against Socrates. But they also took that back into their plays. So many of these Socrates plays have Aristophanes appear in these plays as a character and among other things, some of them have him appear in the scene uh, in the Phaedo where Socrates is in his prison cell and have him being contrite or apologize to Socrates that he didn't mean to cause these sentiments against Socrates, that he just wanted to have a good bit of fun and, and so on and so forth. So they were very conscious that to be a writer of comedies was writing in the tradition of Aristophanes whom Socrates himself declared to be one of his important and early enemies. So there is a struggle in this uh, tradition of comedy, a struggle that uh, uh, these writers tried to resolve one way or another, but they, it led to comedy becoming an important genre in, for the drama of ideas. And that's an important thing to contemplate because often we tend to think of tragedy as the heftier more existential and in some ways more philosophical drama. Most of the philosophers who comment on theater, when philosophers comment on theater at all, usually tend to side with tragedy, though there are notable exceptions like Kierkegaard and others, Stanley Cavell. Um, but most philosophers, when they engage the theater, think about tragedy and leading to this impression that tragedy is the weightier and more philosophical of the, of the two major genres. Not so these co uh, uh, comedic writers recognizing a co comic strain in Plato and taking that into 
their own plays. So both Shaw and Oscar Wilde, uh, uh, by returning to Plato, start a tradition in modern drama that I think is closer to a drama of ideas. In Shaw's case, he even gives it that name, or play of ideas. And you can find this throughout the history of modern drama. I could talk, for example, about Brecht, who writes a series of philosophical dialogue in which he basically re-articulates his, his entire theory of theater by confronting it with the figure of a philosopher who thinks about the uh, uh, Brecht's, Brechtian theater from this philosophical lens. Um, I could talk about Tom Stoppard, who is particularly interesting in this respect, because he, I would say, tries to combine the two traditions, the tradition of Oscar Wilde's aestheticism and Shaw's comedies of ideas, and tries to bring them together in several of his most successful plays. So there's a tradition then of the drama of ideas or of a philosophical drama that is quite important for modernism and modernism's relation to theater. So let me take this back to the beginning. I, just, I started by making a distinction, a distinction between a kind of dominant form of modernism represented by the right of spring, a modernism invested in bodies, in rituals, in primitivism, in shock value. And I said that by going back to Plato, I would kind of trace a second lineage of a, of a modernism, especially in drama and theater, uh, that seemingly does the opposite. A modernism invested in ideas, in a tradition of a kind of platonic philosophical drama that leads, especially in, in, in Britain, but in, in other traditions as well, to a kind of modern drama of ideas. I, for the record, want to say that I like both of these forms of modernism. And sometimes I wonder whether they are really that clearly opposed. Uh, so I want a little bit undo that opposition I started out with. Because I think of these two models, not so much as two traditions, but as two perspectives on modernism. So I wonder, and since you have been spending a lot of time thinking about the Rite of Spring. I wonder whether you, uh, you know, we could uh, all together figure this out, whether one can, in fact, even in something as quintessentially ritualistic and primitivistic and corpore corporeal and shock shocking as the Rite of Spring, find elements of this other tradition, of this philosophical tradition. I'm not so sure, but I think that might be possible. Certainly, if I contemplate um, um, Stravinsky's later work, especially his turn to classicism after he comes to the United States, his lectures at Harvard, they seem to veer, to my mind, closer perhaps to certain aspects of this second philosophical aspiration with, within modernism. Um, and of course, it is also true that what, what attracts me to this tradition of the philosophical drama is not only that these dramatists use ideas and in some ways materialize them on the stage or in their plays, but that they're also trying to use the theater, the full material repertoire for the theater, for these philosophical ends. So this platonic or philosophical tradition that I've been describing to, to you does not do away with bodies or with corporeality or with material interaction between actors and bodies entirely. It uses them, and this, I think, was what's so interesting about Plato's philosophy, that even though it's often presented as completely disregarding the body, that we have to leave the body behind in order to reach a realm of ideas, this is sort of the standard form of the theory of forms, that he expresses that philosophy in, a, as I've described, in a form of drama, namely that he invents bodies, invents interactions, invents scenes, uh, in order to do that. So there is a very dynamic interaction here, to my mind, between what we associate with modernist materiality and that underground tradition of a kind of platonic theory of forms that seems to disappear, but is actually quite important for this alternative tradition of modernism. 
So I want to end, therefore, on a conciliatory note because I love the Rite of Spring and what it stands for, and maybe it can even be incorporated into the scheme. Thank you very much. Martin. Um, I was wondering whether the turn towards Plato and away from Aristotle and the unities that are called Aristotelian, um, and Shaw's turn to the play of ideas and his attack on the well-made play on Radigan and Sardou, um, does that represent, and here I'm going back to an earlier conversation before this talk, a turn away from narrative? in particular, especially if you're separating out a lineage of philosophical drama and the Rite of Spring mm -hmm. as interested in ritual, which after all has a strong repetitive narrative element to it. Interesting. So I think I would not say that the sti if we maintain the distinction for the time being between this kind of ritualistic modernism and this philosophical modernism, I don't think that uh, narrative clearly falls on either side. So I don't think Shaw rejects narrative at all, and I don't think Plato rejects narrative. I mean, I think that's one of the things that's so interesting about the dialogues, that they are not, it's not a treatise, but there, there is a narrative in them, although it's a strange narrative, as it says. It's, it's often meandering, it, there are dead ends, it starts all over, there's something often repetitive about it, it many of them lead, end abruptly unresolved, and so on and so forth. But there's clearly a progression in plot some characters enter the dialogues, others leave. So, so there's clearly a, a movement, though it's not always a movement towards a clear goal. Um, as I said, many of them end abruptly or with, without a solution, though not, not, not all. But that doesn't mean that there aren't narrative. Uh, and so too, I would say that, um, that these playwrights don't reject narrative at all. Though I would say that there is, so even though there's, there is plot, um, it is true though, and, and I agree with you to that extent, that this interest in the interaction between bodies and ideas, let's just call it that, is a different dynamic and sometimes interrupts the narrative or it's a kind of second axis along which these plays proceed. And I think that's true of Plato's dialogues. Uh, but it's also very true of, uh, uh, of Shaw's plays. Now, you know, a good example is, is, um, is Man and Superman, which, is, which has an, an outer comedy, which involves, in fact, a chase and, and uh, you know, a woman chasing a man and so on and so forth. It's a, it's a comedy that ends in marriage. So very clear, plot-driven, story, but there's a play within the play that interrupts, and it's huge, uh, Don Juan in Hell, that interrupts the narrative and moves to a form of a more or less uh, disembodied uh, philosophical dialogue. In fact, it is disembodied because it takes place in the afterlife, where in fact the bodies are just appearances and you can change your body, so that it, it's, it's, it's literally a disembodied play and the stage directions are fant fascinating because they are, they really almost read like Beckett because suddenly the stage is wiped clean. There are only spotlights here and there and these figures appear uh, uh, um, lavishly dressed out of nowhere, uh, have full control over their corporeal appearance and, and engage in kind of a dialogue. It's really a very modernist moment in, in Shaw. But in any case, it interrupts narrative. So this interruption, so I think there is something um, in addition to narrative that has to happen in these, or that does happen in these philosophical 
plays. I, I mean, I, I sometimes tend to think of it as both that, that there's a kind of horizontal and a vertical, that the horizontal is the narrative, but then there is this vertical tension between bodies and ideas. And so these plays are pulled sort of in both directions or both dimensions. So, um, and on the other hand, I'm not sure that ritual really is primarily narrative. It's repetitive, as you say. Uh, so there, is, there are narrative elements in, in, in ri ritualistic drama. There's a narrative in, in, in Sacre du Printemps. Uh, but I wouldn't say that narrative is sort of the driving mode of this re-ritualized art of modernism. Um, there, I would say, in contrast to the kind of uh, uh, idea and body tension that I see in the philosophical, uh, the version of philosophical art, there it is, has more to do with communality, uh, with sort of interactions between participants, spectators, and actors, and this kind of fantasy that many modernists uh, pursued of that, that ritual would, would uh, make art relevant, that it would, it would create a community and so on and so forth. So I'd say there are narratives uh, of some kind on, on, uh, 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 on in both of these traditions, but that their main thrust uh, is somewhere else. Tension between body and ideas on the one hand and this kind of re-ritualization on the other. That's how I tend to think of it, at least. Yeah, on the, oh, sorry, about, sorry about that. And along the, lame, uh, the same lines with respect to Man and, uh, um, the Shaw, Shaw's play, I mean, that particular one, Man and Superman, is interesting because the play itself is sandwiched between a long preface yes. and then Tanner's own manifesto, right. the, Re the Revolutionary's Handbook. Right. And, right. you know, insofar as we're talking about narrative, I can't think of that term without thinking about its own material form, the book. Yeah. And Shaw was profoundly interested in the material form in which his plays were published, much more so than, to my knowledge, any other playwright before. Yeah. Um, that said, I'm interested in the ways in which modern drama has this other, um, not opposite, but this, this, there's an other in, the, in modernity that is competing with, with, uh, with a theater, namely cinema. Mm -hmm. And I'm interested in what you might say about the, um, cinema and philosophy or a cinema of ideas, whether it's something like, you know, a, to my mind, a, a profoundly uh, philosophically rich film like Stanley Kubrick's 2001, a talk piece like um, um, uh, the Wallace Shawn uh, film My premiere. Dinner with Andre. My Dinner with Andre, thank you. Right. Or some of Richard Linklater's uh, mm -hmm. indie films like Slacker or Waking Life, which are yeah. Uh, overtly concerned with philosophy, metaphysics, right. epistemology, etc. Right. You mentioned the Matrix. <laughs> of course, the Matrix. Which is, of course, <laughs> which many people have reinvented about. for our time. I mean, it's, it's clearly the kind of cave, uh, that supreme piece of theatrical imagination uh, um, reinvented for the uh, virtual world. I, and, and so, an, an, an excellent question. Um, um, so first, I think you're absolutely right about uh, that, that, that Man and Superman doesn't consist of two parts, these two plays, the play within them, but, but of four parts. And it's interesting that the, the revolutionist handbook, a kind of manifesto that turns into essentially Wildian aphorisms at the end. And it's one of these things, you know, at first blush, Wilde and Shaw seem like as opposed as they could be, but the more I think about those two, the, the, the more similar they seem to me. They are both, their main move is inversion. Uh, Shaw has a more political kind of uh, uh, bent and wild, uh, you know, this kind of dandyish inversion, but they both love inversion and they, they are, there are moments where, where, where Shaw's plays be, are very close to something like importance of being earnest and so on and so forth. So the, the, relu the end of the Revolution's handbook is, is a good example. It's just kind of Wildian aphorisms. Um, and, and you're also right, Shaw play, pay, uh, uh, paid a lot of attention to the print, to the quality of the paper. He drove his printers crazy, but he also considered them important collaborators. 
uh, uh, so this, this print manifestation, it's, it's a separate story about modern drama that I find fascinating. It's part of the story how, how drama becomes literature in the first place and how it becomes print and the, the tension then from then on about uh, drama uh, as reading matter and drama as a means of, uh, you know, as an end towards performance is, is one of the interesting dynamics and splits within that tradition. It's a separate, separate story perhaps. Uh, now to cinema, I mean, I, 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 I think you're absolutely right. Uh, you know, certain films by Godard also come to mind. Um, I suppose um, if one now turns to the philosophers of cinema, I mean, two very different ones come to mind, and that's Deleuze and Cavell. Uh, and of course, Cavell cuts across both drama and, and cinema. I think uh, among the uh, living philosophers, he's one of the most engaged with with drama certainly, but also with cinema. Uh, the other one is, would be someone like Alain Badiou, who hates the cinema precisely because the cinema is Deleuze's baby and because he once started, tried to start a, a dialogue with Deleuze, which Deleuze more or less refused and he never forgave him for it. With French philosophers, there's always kind of a personal story behind it, I suppose. Um, but, you know, so for Deleuze, and I, I'm not, uh, I don't know Deleuze as, as well as I probably should, and especially his two works on cinema, but I think the primary category for Deleuze that cinema and philosophical category that cinema allows him to think through that cinema thinks about his time. So, uh, uh, but I can't really reconstruct that argument for you, but that's probably who I would turn to to articulate a similar dialogue between cinema and philosophy to the one I'm doing with theater and philosophy. I should also add that I'm half, in a sense, given you only sort of half the story, the theater incorporating the, uh, the, the, the the theater drama incorporating philosophy. There's a different, there's a counter story to that of philosophers uh, uh, deeply engaged with, with the theater. So, but I think one could do uh, uh, um, uh, that with cinema, though, you know, the great thing about theater is that it is so old and that you can have, you have this entire history of philosophy from Plato through Rousseau and Nietzsche to, to Stanley Cavell available for that kind of dialogue, whereas in cinema, obviously, that history is shorter, but I think it could be begun, and that would be very interesting. My uh, students and I spent this morning talking about the credibility of three contemporary portraits of Socrates, one by Aristophanes, one by Xenophon, and the other by Plato. And I think at the end of class, we, we, were, we became suspicious about each of the three. You acknowledge some consciousness of Aristophanes' legacy in later playwrights. Mm -hmm. But I guess I just wanted to ask, is, is it your view that in that competition between Aristophanes, Xenophon, and Plato, that it was Plato's portrait that became the dominant one in later centuries, and whether or not you thought there was any irony in the fact that the one that was most the most dramatic and theatrical became the historical reality. Yes, no, it's, 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 it's a good question. So I, uh, I think I may have mentioned this to you earlier. It's interesting that, so I, I cheated a little bit when I described uh, these uh, authors uh, of Socrates' plays as being primarily engaged with Plato. On the whole, they were primarily engaged with Plato, but there were not a few who also drew on Xenophon. And, and as you may know, Xenophon, especially in the, in, the, in, the, um, in the 18th century, was probably the more uh, important source for knowledge of, of uh, uh, for, not, you know, for, for kind of historical information about, about Socrates. One reason why I don't spend a lot of time worrying about it is because what interests me in Plato is not the question of the kind of historical portrait, but precisely the invention, as Shaw uh, says, of Plato's invention of Socrates as a dramatic char character. And it's very clear that it is Plato's Socrates and not someone else's Socrates. So I'm, I, I'm, I'm less in this project, in a sense, I, I'm sort of uh, all for that invention. I'm not worried about uh, uh, mining 
Plato or, or Xenophon or Aristophanes for, for historical information about Plato. I mean, that's uh, about so uh, Socrates. That's an important project, uh, uh, but it's not one that I'm concerned with here. So for me, uh, in this project, uh, uh, Socrates is Plato's creation and the creation of all these other dramatists. Uh, and the same goes for, since we're talking about questions of historical authenticity, for the, about, uh, goes for these other anecdotes I mentioned, Diogenes Laertius for one, and the, the other anecdote uh, about uh, Socrates attending a performance of, of the clouds and standing up so that the audience could compare uh, the Socrates on stage with the real Socrates. I mean, none of them are probably authentic. Um, again, I don't worry about it too much because what interests me is that these later sources and commentators would associate Socrates and Plato with the theater, put them at least sort of in the outskirts or the environment of the theater, would show them, in the case of Diogenes Laertius, as associating with, with thespians of, of various kinds. So it's that kind of association uh, uh, that, that interests me in these sources by these authors. Uh, um, it's not a, a project in historical reconstruction. On the contrary, I consider this whole reading, as I, uh, I think I indicated, this whole reading of Plato as a dramatist is in some way an anachronistic one. Because Plato wasn't, even though they, they, some of these sources associate him kind of with the theater, he was not in the Athenian sense of, 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 of theater, a dramatist. Uh, but I would say that to us and to these moderns, and that's why people like Strindberg and, and, and Kaiser and Wilde and Shaw and these others recognize something dramatic in, in Plato because the notion of theater and of drama had changed and it had changed in a way that actually brought drama or a certain tradition of drama closer to Plato, what, what, what Plato had done. So in a sense, uh, in retrospect, um, after a theater had changed and developed in a certain tradition, dramatists were able to, to reconnect to this earlier writer uh, uh, and, and see in him a predecessor where uh, uh, Plato himself and his contemporaries would have been surprised by this claim. So that's how I would describe uh, my project. Uh, um, but I think you are absolutely right. Xenophon plays a role in this uh, reception history, this dramatic reception history of of, of, of Socrates, uh, especially in the 18th century. Yeah. Thank you, Martin, for that uh, very interesting lecture. You mentioned briefly uh, at the end of your remarks Tom Stoppard, and I, I thought maybe you were thinking of a play like Arcadia, mm -hmm. where you certainly have a drama of ideas, but I was thinking of uh, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead, and in fact, the theater of the absurd generally, yeah. where uh, often there are very few characters, right. Vladimir and Estragon right. or Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, not much happens in terms of plot. Right. In fact, in Waiting for Godot, they talk about nothing is happening. Right. Uh, there's a, a strong element of humor in these yeah. plays, uh, often slapstick uh, clowns. Right. Uh, or sexual uh, innuendos and so forth. Uh, but, it, but it's certainly uh, comedy in the service of a rather grim philosophical view of human nature and society. So all those things are just yeah. running through my mind as I listen right. to you, right. and uh, I, right. I made that particular connection. Yeah. No, absolutely, and that, that is also important to me. And in general, this whole notion of the theater of the absurd is such an interesting episode in this collaboration between theater and philosophy. Because you know, existentialism, of course, uh, created by uh, Sartre and, and to some extent Camus, who both wrote plays uh, um, and tried to translate some th uh, th their existentialist philosophy into drama for good reasons, because the situation is, in a sense, the key term, I would say, of existentialism, that you are thrown into a situation and you have kind of this scenic uh, moment right there in, in, in Sartre's No Exit, for example, right? You have a situation and you throw characters in and they have to deal with it. So there's drama to the extent that drama is an art form that 
is based on a particular place and scene and situation is in a sense perfect. The characters are actually in hell. Right? Exactly, they are actually in hell. Uh, uh, and so uh, uh, it, it, no, 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 no surprise that both Sartre and Camus wrote are you know, playwriting philosophers and that's a particular and interestingly French, primarily, not exclusively, but primarily French, uh, French tradition. Now, the interesting argument about that sort of earlier philosophical moment is that, as, as Martin Esselin and others have, have argued, the interesting thing about uh, these plays of Sartre and Camus is that while they seem to translate certain elements of, 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 the, of existentialism and, and the absurd into theater, that they are actually still more too conventional in their form, in their use of language, in their use of dialogue, and that was this next generation of Beckett and early Pinter and so on and so forth who in a sense completed uh, that translation um, that what in a sense what th th these are no longer philosophical plays in the sense that you have kind of philosophers on stage this is no longer the kind of Socrates on stage kind of play but that these uh, the theater of the absurd is indeed a very, a very canny and interesting translation of, uh, of existentialism into, into theater and, and more interesting and more important and more enduring than the plays of these philosophers themselves. So I totally agree. And it's also interesting that it's precisely the theater of the absurd, especially Beckett, of, of all playwrights, uh, uh, with the exception perhaps of, of Sophocles, who has attracted the most philosophical commentary by Adorno, again, Stanley Cavell is a name that seems to be, keep coming up. So uh, in a sense, a, a history that starts with a, a philosophical movement, existentialism, then goes through various stages of translation into dramatic form, and then uh, inspires a series of important philosophers in turn. So I, I, I'm glad you bring it up. Uh, and, and I totally agree. Uh, another uh, uh, crucial element in that in that in that history. Yeah. Uh, great. Um, thank you. Um, in your discussion right now, you're mentioning of, of of theater absurd, and particularly Beckett, who begins to answer the question that I've been interested in. Um, especially here in like in the Shavian sort of idea play context, um, which is in what ways did Shaw see, or do you see Shaw's work, uh, see the theatrical apparatus occasion encounter being a situation that um, enhanced the encounter with philosophical ideas? So I, like, I can see clearly how in the context of um, Beckett or UNESCO, that the um, encounter with corporeality, with the mm -hmm. act of the utterance of language and its failure and all these things are particularly apt yeah. for, for theater. Um, how did the sort of uh, the occasion of the scenic work mm -hmm. of Shaw mm -hmm. uh, function yeah. there? So I, so I would say in Shaw it actually doesn't function all that different. So, you know, since we, we have been using Man and Superman as an example, let's, let's look at that. Um, so one of, let's say, the prejudices against this kind of Shavian drama of ideas, and that the same goes for Stoppard, is that, well, there are these philosophical characters, and they go on and on and on, and they give you the theories, and the you know, theater just becomes kind of a vehicle for philosophy, and it's, it's, it's second-rate philosophy and boring theater, so why should we even do that? And, you know, I, 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 I'm not entirely unsympathetic. I think that some of Stoppard's weaker plays, for example, do succumb to that, though his best plays don't. Uh, same for Shaw. So, uh, and I think Man and Superman is, a, is, is one of the good examples because in that play there is a philosopher, Tanner, right, who is kind of the, who is the one who develops all the relevant theories in that play that are then also attached, uh, appended to the play in the, uh, in the, in the re revolutionist's handbook. But he's a comic figure in the butt of every joke. The revolutionist's handbook 
actually makes an appearance in the play and in the first act it is thrown away into the waste basket. So it's interesting that Shaw does not privilege this philosophical character, but constantly undermines him and undermines him in that play. So the, the, the slightly complicated thing is that play is, is premised on another even stranger philosophical concoction of, of Shaw's, namely the, the life force. So he has this theory that, the, that there's this thing, the life force, and that the life force works through women. And then it's all part of this kind of idea-driven evolutionary theory of history that I, I, I alluded to, and that this life force acts through women, uh, and then through women brings about unions, sexual unions between men and women to produce a certain kind of offspring that would you move us forward to the next stage of evolution. That's where the Superman comes, comes in. And Shaw kind of scarily, I think, really believed that kind of stuff. So, uh, so you have Tanner as a philosopher uh, uh, spouting off these theories, which Shaw kind of believes in. I mean, Tanner presents them in a kind of more over-the-top way, but they're, they certainly resonant, resonate with what, what Shaw himself says. Um, but then the, the, the plot of this outer comedy, and that's why this outer comedy isn't just kind of a, 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 a window dressing, um, is such that um, Tanner, the, the main protagonist, keeps running away from Anne, this woman. It's an inverted Don Juan story. Um, and uh, doesn't recognize that in the end he will succumb to her anyway. So in a sense, he has the right theory of the plot, but he doesn't recognize what's going on, and in the end, uh, the outer comedy, in a sense, wins. So it's a very interesting, and this goes back to narrative too, it's a very interesting kind of constellation of, on the one hand, of a certain kind of marriage comedy, a plot, that, that acquires the strange kind of philosophical uh, superstructure of evolutionary theory and so on and so forth of the life force, and a, and a philosophical character who kind of gets it right in theory but not in practice. It's a very, so it's a very interesting way of combining these things in ways that isn't just that there's kind of a philosophical hero in the play who tells us what's what. So, I, so it's a, so a similar constellation uh, occurs in Stoppard, for example, in, a, in an er, one of the earlier plays, uh, Jumpers, uh, uh, where he uh, mobilizes theater in a very interesting way to, and confronts it with abstract philosophical ideas. That's when the philosophical tradition becomes, I think, most interesting. When it's not just when theater isn't just used a means to an end as a kind of pedagogical uh, vehicle, but uh, when there's a kind of confrontation between this material corporeal art form of theater and 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 ideas or philosophies, and and in, in the most interesting cases uh, of this tradition, that's what happens. Though uh, you know, I, I must admit that that there are also many bad examples of it at, at the same time. Yeah. And, and, and is life force an example of a way in which the very content of the philosophical notion is also something that kind of references the kind of corporeal and extracorporeal interaction of exactly. life theater? Exactly, exactly. And so, you know, so the, uh, the, another way of looking at this, uh, so why is, do so many or the, even perhaps the best examples of this philosophical drama tradition become comedies. We can turn to someone like Bergson as an explanation who, who thinks that comedy happens when an actor is in the grip of an idea and uh, that there is something inherently comic about uh, a philosopher on stage. That's in a way what all these writers of Socrates' comedies, uh, excuse me? Case in point. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, that there is something funny if you drag philosophers on the stage and then they're kind of in the group. Of, anyway, so they're, they're, it, it's, it's an interesting um, uh, genre dialogue between philosophical drama and comedy. Yeah. That has to do with corporeality because comedy, that's what comedy mo mobilizes, of course. Yeah.
I'm going to give myself the privilege of the last question, and I'm going to make you return to the Rite of Spring. Okay. Um, and, you know, what struck me listening to your talk was, um, sure, the Rite of Spring is primitivist and tries to re recreate this ritual, but boy, it's an awfully heady primitivism. Right. I mean, this is an right. intellectual primitivism. Right. I mean, it's all out of the idea. Right. So I just wanted to get kind of yes. your response to that. No, and I think this is where I was heading at the end, and I, and I, and I totally uh, agree. And if one, I think that's, you know, one could precisely pursue that idea that it is kind of a project, that we must now do that. Uh, and yes, if you, um, if you just kind of bracket everything and just look at the kind of, thrust of this intention, it, it's pure primitivism. But if you look at the actual practice, uh, it, it's, it, right, it, it becomes more like, a, like another idea, in a sense. I think that's true. I think it's true. Um, or, or kind of interesting projection. Uh, I, 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 uh, and, and uh, you know, even, I mean, this, the same could probably be said about uh, uh, the Bali Rus, I mean, it's there. There's such a kind of emphasis on, on. Yes, if you compare it to 19th century ballet, it maybe seemed kind of crazy and so on and so forth. But it was a very controlled kind of movement, as far as one can tell. It was there's a classicism to it. Uh, 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 I mean, the you know, Nijinsky, the beautiful body. Uh, uh, Plato would have been happy with. <laughs> well, let, let's thank Martin one more time. Mm -hmm.